Well, I uh, want to say that I'm honored to be here to make some remarks as part of this inaugural Carter G. Woodson lecture. I want to thank Alan Gould, Bernice Morris, and everyone else who had a part in helping uh, shape this event and make it happen. Bishop Moore, it's a pleasure uh, to have you here with us. I look forward to your remarks. Dr. Gould has uh, spoken so highly of you, uh, and he said uh, to me that you were talking about some of the aspects of race relations, so I wanted to talk a little bit about my experiences as a prelude to your discussion. Um, some of you probably have heard me talk before about my upbringing, and I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi in the 1950s and 60s, and I've said that in many ways it was an idyllic time. It was a really large city with a small town feel. You could go anywhere you wanted to, do, to go and do almost anything you wanted to do provided one thing, and that is that you were white. It was the Jim Crow South, so there was complete separation of the races. It was all us little white kids knew was segregation. It was an ugly and hateful system that was disguised as normalcy. We didn't know any better, but we knew deep down that something was wrong. I think all of us knew it. In Vacation Bible School, we sang red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. And that didn't match up with reality. Something was wrong, and we all knew it deep down. There was a whole lot done in those days to hide the truth from us, to perpetuate the lie that race was meant to separate us into classes. If you ever saw the movie The Help, that was about my hometown, Jackson, Mississippi. But as I told many people, that movie did not really do a good job of depicting how very bad segregation really was. The movie was a much whitewashed version of what Jackson was like. But there were chinks in the armor of segregation that would later help bring the system down. We were fortunate to have leaders like Carter Woodson and Martin Luther King Jr. who in using the biblical term took the scales off our eyes so that we could truly see the truth and the light. In my own personal journey, I also give credit to my ninth grade English teacher, Mrs. Beatrice Moore, a highly educated and highly talented African-American woman who still lives in Jackson, Mississippi. She helped me shatter the myths and lies about black people. For you see, I had never met an educated black person prior to her because we were separated. We were kept from each other so that we could perpetuate the lies. She was truly a caring and wonderful person who changed my life, and I will forever be grateful to her. And how blessed we are in a nation to be celebrating Dr. Carter Woodson's life, uh, his work, and this month, the 90th anniversary of Black History Month. Together and because of Dr. Woodson's persistence, we've come a long ways from those early days, and we've got a lot to be thankful for. There were many attributes that furthered Dr. Woodson's relentless devotion to education for all African Americans. But among the most impressive was his belief that education could overcome racism. That was certainly my experience with Mrs. Beatrice Moore. Dr. Woodson forced, focused so much of his work specifically on breaking down the educational barriers for African Americans and pursued a better understanding of African-American history for all, all of us, the collective we. So when I was thinking about these remarks, I thought about the event back in December, the welcoming event to bring me here as president. Uh, and there I talked about the we in the refrain, we are Marshall. About how, how I, <coughs> excuse me, about how I had already found that that was a very inclusive we and one of the most compelling things about our university. There is a hope, love, and unity of spirit, of spirit embedded 
within those three short words. I knew from my first visit to campus that the phrase was a very inclusive one and that the we really reflected acceptance and respect. This is a very special place, Marshall. And as president, I pledge to always make sure that Marshall embodies an inclusive we, one that welcomes all students to our campus and gives them the proper respect and opportunities they deserve. It does not matter what race, religion, creed, sexual orientation, veteran status, disability, or any other factor you can think of, we are all the same here at Marshall, and I will fight for that belief. In closing, I implore us as educators to consider Dr. Woodson's quote, the mere imparting of information is not education. Through his quote, Dr. Woodson encourages us to translate our teaching to doing. It is not enough for us to be complacent where we are with race relations or equality in general. We must make it our duty to further Dr. Woodson's mission for making educational sites beacons for understanding and, accept and acceptance. I am grateful to be here today, and I thank all of you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. President. It's very well spoken. Um, I can think of no more appropriate person to launch this new series, this new lecture series dedicated to Dr. Woodson than the guest speaker who generously accepted my uh, invitation to speak on this occasion. And of course, as most of us know, it's Bishop Samuel R. Moore. If I may, I'll share just a few things about the good bishop. And I'm sure most of you probably know them anyway. Reverend Moore was born in Welsh, West Virginia. Now for the, is that true? All right. <laughs> you worry me for a minute. Didn't think it was Welsh, Virginia. <laughs> Welch, West Virginia. Uh, for the uninformed, Welch is located not only in West Virginia, but really in the free state of McDowell. Is that not right? I'm, I'm not saying it right. McDowell. All right. Um, he received his secondary education at uh, Graham High School in Bluefield, Virginia. Earned his Bachelor of Science in Education at Bluefield State University, and later received his master's degree in education from Marshall University. So, as you might expect, the good bishop bleeds green. <laughs> He's worked as a classroom uh, educator for over 30 years in Mercer County, West Virginia, Tazewell County, Virginia, and the Cabell County School Systems. As testimony to his highly successful teaching career, Reverend Moore received the Milken Award for Education Excellence in 2000. And after working years in school administration, he conducted uh, race relations workshops in Cabell County Schools. Additionally, Reverend Moore has served as pastor of the Full Grace Gospel Assembly here in Huntington for more than 30 years. And after retiring from his work as an educator, he began his full-time ministry in 2010. And in 2012, August of that year, was elected and consecrated bishop of the West Virginia and East Tennessee Council of Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Moreover, as many here in the know, Reverend Moore has served as a model in assisting and ministering to the needs of his fellow citizens. Among many church-sponsored ministries that reached into the Huntington community is his involvement with Kids of the Kingdom, which is an outreach program for children grades age, grades one through five. Heads up, a sculpture-based support ministry group 
for African American males, ages 20 and over, and the establishment of the annual Youth Empowerment Conference. Now these few examples that I have cited are only a representative sample of the numerous church-related ministries in which he's actively involved. Likewise, Reverend Moore has given generously of his time and talent to a number of civic organizations for the betterment of his fellow Huntingtonians. That impressive list includes two terms as president of the Huntington Cavill Branch of the NAACP, president of the board of directors of the Ebenezer Community Early Childhood Learning Center, as a member of the board of directors of the Cavill Huntington Hospital and BASF Community Advisory Panel. And as many here know, he's one of the founders of Unlimited Futures, which is located in our Fairfield West community. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my esteemed pleasure to give to you the presenter of the inaugural address of the Woodson Lecture, Bishop Samuel R. Moore. So I cannot, I can't begin to express how incredibly honored I am to be asked to come and to be a part of this, Dr. Ernest Morris and others of you who have come to share on this occasion. There's my wife there, God bless you. Um, just to be a part of this celebration is, is, is beyond my ability to express. And uh, Dr. Gilbert, thank you for that very, well, very uh, gracious welcome. I want to talk to you today, as was mentioned here, on the deceitfulness of difference. As was mentioned, I, I grew up in, in McDowell County. It's, uh, we moved to, to the city and we call it McDowell. When I was growing up, it was McDowell. <laughs> you have to get the, uh, the correct accent or the correct syllable. Uh, as Dr. Gould mentioned, I, I was born in Welch, but that was because they didn't have a hospital in Gary. I was, uh, my home was Gary. I lived in Welch. I was born in Welch. Uh, again, that was the hospital, but I, I always grew up uh, in, a, in an environment that I thought was a very nurturing environment, and I was fortunate to have been a part of that community, and I'll share some of this with you in the presentation. When we talk about the deceitfulness of difference, I think it's important that we understand that so many people lock into the differences that we have among ourselves and miss the similarities, and that's what I hope to get to today is to help us to uh, be more aware, more attentive to how much alike we are. Culture is one of the things that um, I think we miss on is defined as a collection of patterns of thoughts, languages, and behaviors, and the tendencies that we have to pass those along to succeeding generations. When we talk about culture, sometimes we forget about the importance of our surroundings and, and forget that those surroundings are what develop us and our personalities and what we become. Uh, I believe that when we uh, live in McDowell County that it's obvious in some cases when we go to say New York that we would stand out and that's because of our surroundings we are products of our environment. And so the culture that exists in the area that we grew up in, the area that we survive in, the area that we uh, have come from, is what shapes our being. I don't know how many times you have been in a situation to where someone has called your house and began talking and they didn't realize they weren't talking to you. They were talking to your child or maybe someone else in the house. And, and the reason for that is the language has been passed along, those patterns seem to be uh, passed along and, and they mimic one another. And so if I'm growing up in McDowell County or if I'm growing up in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi, uh, there's going to be a different kind of accent that I have and that has to do with culture. Unfortunately, language becomes the determining factor in a lot of cases, uh, in, in, in a lot of people's minds, as to how intelligent one is. We tend to listen to a person's patterns of speech and we make predeterminations about their levels of intelligence, which is altogether wrong. And so I want to share with you again that we, growing up in Gary, 
was, was a Gary, West Virginia. I, I used to tell people when I'd travel, my father was a minister also, and we would travel around uh, different places, especially in the summer. And I would go visiting relatives and whatnot. And I would go and, and, and play with the kids, and they'd, ask, they'd invariably ask, where are you from? And I'd say, Gary, because everybody ought to know where that is. And uh, the, I was offended because they always, almost always thought, Gary, Indiana. And I said, no, that's, that's wrong. It's, it's the real Gary is where I'm from. <laughs> uh, growing up in Gary was, uh, I think, a melting pot. It was a nice uh, environment, a nice lab. We lived, literally, the, the African-American population lived on the other side of the tracks. It was in the coal mining community. You would have the mountain. You'd have the highway. You'd have the creek. And then you had the railroad tracks, and you have our road. We, we didn't have streets, we had roads. And if any of you can relate to Red Dog, and that, I'm not talking about anything that you drink. Red Dog was the kind of stuff you put on the, it, when we didn't have paid roads, they'd burn the, uh, the, the residue from the coal mine, and they'd dump that on the, t on, the, on the roads to keep the mud from being too prominent. And so we, I lived across the tracks from my friends. Summers were interesting because in the summer, we would play with one another. We'd play all together. We'd play in the creek. We'd wade in the creek. We'd play football. We'd play baseball. We'd go blackberry picking. We'd go apple. You know, we'd go and we'd throw apples at one another. We'd pick apples till we got tired, and then we'd fight. We'd do all sorts of things together. We were, it was all a melting pot. But then later, uh, there were some changes that took place when the summer ended. I was fortunate to grow up in an environment where I had people uh, that because of the coal mining community, various cultures came together in that area. And again, very fortunate I was to be in that, in that environment. Um, I had friends named Nagoski and Zick and Miano and, and Patowski, uh, friends that were of uh, various cultural backgrounds, and so we learned to get along. Unlike in some situations where we'd have a very sterile environment, you may not interact with people as much as it might be necessary. And so the culture was something that we developed. This culture was something that we learned. I'd like you to look at this and read that for me. Read that, please. Okay, now look at it and read it again. <laughs> so we tend to see what we want to see. We tend to see what we've been programmed to see. Clearly, it didn't say once upon a time. But we're so accustomed to it being once upon a time that even though we saw that, and each, all of you, each of you are, are, are very literate. I understand that. But you read it wrong. Because you didn't, not because you saw it wrong, but because it appeared to you wrong. And that's one of the things that I think is important for us to see, that often we will see, and we don't really see what we see. Things that we imagine get in the way, preconceived notions get in the way of what really exists. And when we're dealing with people, it's vitally important that we not just take the first glance and recall what we've been taught or what we've been accustomed to. It's important that we see what we see. Uh, growing up in Gary, West Virginia, my, I, I was born in the same year of the Brown versus Board of Education uh, ruling came down. Uh, 1954, there was a, the, the white school and then there was the, the colored school. Back in those days, it was colored. I've been colored, I've been Negro, I've been black, I've been African, I've been it all. I've been, I've, we've gone through all these transitions. Back then it was the colored school. I never liked colored, because it to me was something that was not real. I never liked hearing anybody call me colored. But that's what, anyway, that's, that's the part of the culture at that time. But during that time, there were separated schools, and so the, um, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education, Olivia Brown and uh, Topeka, Kansas, her parents sued because she was having to walk past the school that was in her neighborhood to get to a school that she was allowed to go to, and so you know the story of the ensuing uh, court case. They finally decided that we would have this separate but equal. And so they decided that now we will integrate schools. 
the desire was never for African Americans, for blacks, for colored, for Negroes. The desire was not intentionally that we go to school with whites. The desire was that we have equal opportunity. That was what the whole plan was. Equal opportunity because the custom and the, the, the process was that the funding for the county school system, and it happened in counties in West Virginia throughout, throughout the nation it was happening, but in counties West Virginia throughout, the funding, the primary funding went to the white school. And so the white school would get the new books, they would get the new materials, they get the new equipment, and then fi in five years, and then when the white school got their new equipment, they would pass their old equipment down to the black school or to the colored school. And so the colored school was getting always hand-me-downs. The football players were getting uniforms that had been in pads that had already been beat up and worn out. The books were already had, had markings in them. They were torn pages. Uh, the equipment was already broken. And so there was something not right about that because it said that there are second-class citizens here that we're not really concerned about because we want to pour, and, and we're going to pour the funding, the primary funding, into the white schools. In spite of that, in spite of that system, so many people in the black schools were able to accomplish great things, not because they had the best, not because they were funded the most, but because there was determination and there were instructors who were teaching them that you can be better and you can accomplish what you desire. So I was going to school there and my parents, during the, the integration, the two schools were separate. My father worked in the coal mines. My grandfather worked in, both our grandfathers worked in the coal mines. My uncles worked, it was, it was like the family business for us. Everybody was going into the coal mines. I, I decided, if we fast forward, that I was not going to the coal mines, not because I was, I was, not because I was too good to go into coal mines, not because I didn't like the money. I was afraid to go into coal mines. <laughs> it did, didn't appeal to me. My father said he would ride sometimes for, for two hours underground to get to his workplace. I'm thinking that's, that's not working for me. I'm, I, you know, that's not what I want to do. I'm not going to do that. So underground for that long just didn't appeal to me. But my father's concept was this. He said, my children are going to the white school. They still had the black school, and there were options now. They were given, the court system said, we'll allow it, but we maintain the two schools. We'll maintain the two separate schools, and we'll still do the funding thing. But if you want to go, you can go. My father said, and his philosophy was this. I can't guarantee that you're going to learn what my boss's children learn, but I'll guarantee you'll be exposed to the same thing. And so he would not allow us to go to the black school, not because he didn't like black folk, but because he wanted to give us another opportunity. And so my sister, my oldest sister, was one of the first uh, in the, in the, to attend the white school. Um, it was interesting. Because, as I said, we were able to play together in the summers. We waded in the creek. We fought. We threw apples at each other. We played football, baseball. We did all these things together. But then um, there was this school thing that came about that separated us. Now, I will say this, that some people are concerned with uh, our attitudes. I believe that prejudice is acceptable. Bigotry is not. I say that with this caveat, I think that everybody, all of us, have prejudices. I think that the more healthy of us recognize them and deal with them. The people that scare me are those people that don't have a prejudice bone in their body. Those people don't recognize that there is some prejudice. Now prejudice to me is not, I don't have a problem with prejudice. Prejudice is just making a choice before you get all the facts. We do that. Prejudging. You make a choice before you get all the facts. Well, I don't know. It's, it's okay for you not to invite me to your, your uh, house parties. I'm not bothered by that. It's okay for you not to want to sit with someone in the, uh, in the theater because maybe of the way they dress. I mean, it's okay for you not to want to be around certain people because of your preconceived notions, but when you start to mistreat those people, I have a problem with you. When you start to treat those people with, with, with different behaviors and you try, you put them under a microscope and you give them a different kind of, of, of preference or lack of preference, 
then we get into bigotry. I, I don't have a problem with prejudice. Y you have a right to decide who your children associate with. You have a right to decide who you date. You have a right to decide who you're going to marry. You have a right to decide you don't like to be around people who are skinny. Or you don't like to be around people who are bald-headed. You, you have a right to decide that. You have a right to choose what you like and decide, but don't mistreat people because of your preferences. I think, again, prejudice is acceptable, but bigotry is not. Your attitudes are your attitudes, but please do not mistreat people because of your attitude. I believe, again, that the seeds of bigotry will not flourish until there is an institution to foster them. I was saying that I played with, with uh, children that were uh, white kids, that were of Italian uh, descent, that were uh, uh, Polish, they were all kinds of, we had a, just a beautiful melting pot there in, in, in Gary, West Virginia, because of the coal mines, people came from various countries to, to be there. But when we got to school, I was different. They, they didn't play with me at school. I was called names when we got to school. There's an institution here. And so what happens is that left alone, when there is no formal institution, we all make it. But when there's a structured institution to foster bigotry and prejudice, then it becomes a problem. Schools, restaurants, hotels, churches, uh, all those institutions that exist and there now we can make a difference. It's up to us. It's up to us to make a determination as to whether we will allow these things to bring barriers or to maintain those barriers to be maintained without addressing them. So we cultivate those, uh, those prejudices through institutions. Uh, my, uh, my daughter, uh, bless her heart, they, they say you can say anything about someone as long as you say bless your heart. <laughs> You, I've heard that. You know, you know, my cousin, he's an idiot, bless his heart. You know, as long as you say bless his heart, it, it cleans things up. My daughter, I love my daughter. It's the only daughter I have. She's a good, good girl. But when she was young, I came home from, I came home from work one day. My daughter's name is Jackie. My wife said, Jackie, Jackie was in kindergarten. My wife said, Jackie says she's not going to school tomorrow. I said, well, when she get to make decisions as to when she's going to school? She said, well, she went to school today and Michael wasn't there. And she said, if Michael's not going tomorrow, she's not going tomorrow. Well, Michael was a little boy across the street that Jackie played with. They were classmates. And so Jackie felt like if Michael, she said if Michael didn't go to school, she'd be the only black kid there. Kindergarten. So I'm thinking, what are they doing down there at that school to make her feel like she has to have some support in order to be in the classroom? And my wife, got, we, we got into discussions about this and we talked about several things. One thing that we talked about was that we make when we, when we talk about people trying to identify, one of the first things we use to identify folk is, what, was it black or white? You know, I mean, we talk, just casually talking. She's trying to give me, what was it, someone black or someone white, you know? So we talked about those things, we talked, but, but then we talked about Jackie, because Jackie and Michael played together. You remember why Jackie wasn't going to school, right? Because Michael wasn't there. And if Michael wasn't there, She'd be the only black kid there. Well, Michael was white. <laughs> Every day Jackie went to school, she was the only black kid in her class. <laughs> but understand what's happening in her mind. She has no concept of the difference in black and white, but she understands she hears this thing, a separation. And since she and Michael play together, he must be black too. <laughs> if we allow children to be children, the, the Bible says this, except ye become as little children, you can't enter into the kingdom. 
So there are some things in innocency that I think we need to draw from. We need to, we need to hold on to. If we allow the children to be children, they'll get along. And if we don't poison them with our own attitudes and say once upon a time, when it says once upon a, a time, then I think they will be much better off. I had a friend who was in Vietnam, he landed in Vietnam, he said, just after they had launched the Tet Offensive, 1964, I think it was, 18 years old, he had been drafted into the military. And uh, he, he shared with me different stories um, each time he would, he would talk, we, he, I'd hear something new. And he said it was difficult for him to talk about what went on at times. He had to just bring layers, of, layers at a time. But he shared with me this. He said when he was going through training, through combat training, he said they, they told us, they taught us to refer to the North Vietnamese as gooks, as Kong, as dogs, as gorillas. But he, in retrospect, never remembered referring to them as men, as soldiers. There's an institution here. And so what I, my takeaway from that is that the, des, the determination for the United, Mil, United States military was to kill those people. And so it's easier to kill them if you can dehumanize them. If you can call them names that are less than human and you make them less than what you are, it's easier for you to hate them because if, you, if you're going to kill them, you've got to hate them. We have that going on in our society today, that we can dehumanize people. And if we dehumanize them, we can hate them as long as we stay away from this. If I don't see you as someone on an equal ground with me, then I can have that hatred for you and I can belittle you. Um, so it's important for us to see that those bigoted seeds not flourish and that we are people who are able to overcome. A more educated population, I believe, is a population that is more tolerant of differences. If we remain in a sterile vacuum, it's easy for us just to talk to ourselves, and it's all like, almost like an incestuous situation. We're not learning any more than what we already know. We're not picking up any more than we've already picked up. We're not grasping anything more than what our mothers and our fathers and our, bless their heart, <laughs> grasp. It's important that we learn more, that we expand our minds. Now, I said earlier that I, that's my thoughts, no, I, don't, I don't have a problem with prejudice. I do have a problem with bigotry. I don't think that you have to embrace everything that everyone does in order to get along with people. I don't have to like what you do. I don't have to like the way you behave. I don't, like that. I don't have to like the way you dress, but I should be tolerant of those things. I should be accepting of that because it's you and it's not me. We don't have to embrace everything that is not what we like, but we should not fight against it. We can't afford to criticize people because they are what they are, because they're not like us, because there is a difference that deceives us, that difference. And so it's important that we expand our horizons, that we strive to learn more and more. We must, I believe, learn to embrace the concept of self-definition. We shall not and must not allow people to define who we are. We must define ourselves. It's important, I was uh, in a group several years ago and I made a statement um, that rankled some people in the Fairfield West community. I was saying that we have, a, we have a, a, the main thoroughfare from, from I-64 downtown and it's named after Hal Greer. By the way, his name wasn't Hal. If I was in church, somebody would say amen. <laughs> yeah. His name was Harold. His name was Harold. S somehow, when he came under the viaduct, <laughs> he became Hal. 
I, I'm not sure about all that. But, but his, his real name was Harold. Th that just catalog that for a moment. We're talking about, okay, just catalog that. So I was complaining that we have a major thoroughfare in the city of Huntington named after Hal Greer, when I think that we should have a, the, the main street in Huntington, if we're gonna name it after somebody, I was saying that I was, I was, I was dynamic. I said, if we're gonna name a street after somebody, we ought to name it after Pete Goodson. Well, I drew fire <laughs> from one deceased member of our, of our community. I mean, went absolutely nuts on me. Yes, it was. <laughs> and, 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 so, and so I was, I was told that, well, you, he was the first black athlete uh, play, uh, recruited to Marshall. I said, I'm not, I'm not denying anything that happened. But what did Hal Greer do for Huntington? Bless his heart. <laughs> I, I couldn't find anyone to tell me what Hal Greer did to pour back into Huntington. And then someone said, well, he put Marshall on the map. Can I tell you that most people don't know Hal Greer went to, Huntington, went to Marshall except people in Huntington? He never promoted himself as being from Huntington, West Virginia or Marshall University. We were proud of that. But I don't know how proud Hal Greer was of it. While Pete Goodson was a man who sacrificed much of his time, took money out of his own pocket, who did lots of things in order to, to help some of our, you're probably a product of Pete Goodson. And, and a lot of people in Huntington now, you mentioned Pete Goodson's name and they perk up because Pete was the man. He was a hero among these people. After coming back from Vietnam, he poured much back into the community. And I'm saying, my point is, we need to select our own heroes. We should not allow other people to decide who our hero is going to be. We ought to determine who we look up to. We have to have the concept of self-definition. We should not allow others to determine who we are. There, there was a, a Bible story. Uh, my friend, Gene, uh, Rabbi Gene, will, will, will relate to this. There was, there was a Bible story about uh, a, a man who was a great conqueror, and he led his people into the conquering this, this nation of people. And he took them away to Babylon. And when he took them away to Babylon, you know, the concept in the old ancient warriors were to the, to the, to the, to the victor belongs the spoils. And so when he won the battle, when they won the battle, they took all that there was and took the good, including the people, back to Babylon. When he took them to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar said, I, I want you all to go out and find the best and the brightest. I want you to get the youth that, that are well favored. Get the ones that are cunning. Get the ones that know how to, how to address themselves, how to go in and out among the people. Get the ones who are skilled in the sciences. Get the best and the brightest and bring them to me and feed them my food and give them my drink because I'm trying to determine what would be a super race. And so there were, there was Belteshazzar. There was uh, Hananiah. There was Ananias, there was Mishael, four from among the multitudes who say, we're not, we're not eating that, we're not drinking that because it's not a part of our culture. We're in a different land, but we're not going to do everything that the people do in this land. We're not going to lose our identity. And so I say to us that it's important that we not lose ourselves because we want to gain acceptance. Let's define ourselves and not allow others to define us. Well. A part of the process there was that they changed the names of these young men, Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. In the Hebrew culture, and point me out, help me out if I'm wrong, but the E-L and the A-H on the end were, associates you with God, their God. Well, when we went to Babylon, the Chaldeans said, we want to change your name because we don't want you to remember who you are. We want you to acclimate into our society. We want, to, we want you to embrace us. We don't even want you to remember your association with who you are. We don't want you to remember how important you are, how special you are. And so they changed their names. We can't afford to let others define ourselves. We must define us. We must define ourselves. We can't afford to let others define us. And so, there are things that I think are important for us to remember as we see these differences 
that exist among the people. We must not allow those differences to control our thought processes. Because there are differences, there are certain socioeconomic barriers that are set up. Uh, I was looking at some literature, and, and this is from 2004, but it says an analysis of the most recent Federal Reserve Board survey of consumer finances data completed on behalf of the Consumer F uh, Federation of America found that in 2004, that's a, a, a year or two ago, African-American car buyers paid much higher loan rates on new and used autos than white Americans. The institution now makes a difference. Uh, 2004, let's fast forward to 2016. The same principles are taking place. Expert researchers in 11 class action suits against major auto finance companies and banks found that blacks and Hispanics were consistently charged higher interest rates on their loans even when there was little difference in factors such as amount financed, term of loan, and most importantly, credit, worth, credit worthiness, said Stuart Rossman, director of litigation for the Boston-based National Consumer Law Center. Institutions will bring about a difference. And differences are seen, and because those differences are seen, people make their own judgments. Years ago, there, were, there was a, uh, a real barrier, m much more pronounced than it is now, between minorities and the dominant white population in the United States. Dr. Gilbert alluded to it. There, there were real barriers that were existing. So much so that while there were, in some families, there were fairer skin uh, members of the, of the family than other members. And sometimes those fair skin members, because we know how they got their fair skin. Right. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so it's, it's all genetic. And, and so, but, but some of them found it convenient to do what we call passing. You don't know, you know passing it. Uh, it passed. Yeah. They, they lived like they were white folk so they could get the benefit that white folk got. Because it seems that I'm losing ground over here. If, if I hold on to who I am, I'm not going to be able to progress as I'd like to. And so I'll pass. I, I had a cousin that passed. She, she, until, until the rest of the family showed up, she's getting away with it. <laughs> Somebody messed around and went to visit. <laughs> Blew her game all out of the wall. <laughs> and so we must learn, again, to embrace the concept of self-definition. We must not allow others to define ourselves. You are somebody, whoever you are, and other people are somebody, whoever they are. And we must learn to accept them and to at least tolerate them. If we don't embrace them, we must learn to tolerate them. And it's important for us to see that close scrutiny may lead us to find that we have more in common than we have differences. Uh, I'm going to conclude this presentation, and, and, but I'd like for you to do something with me here. Uh, I'd like for all of you who are black or African American, just stand up with me. Okay, okay. Everybody has a shaved head. Okay. If anyone here who's ever, ever participated in a protest, stand up. Okay. If, if, even if you've written a letter of protest or something, a letter of complaint. All right. Anyone in this room who's ever had surgery, stand up. You can keep on standing. You can fit in any of these categories. You don't, don't, don't sit back there. Nobody told you to sit there. Okay, everybody's got freckles. Stand up. Okay. Yeah, me too. Everybody wears glasses. If you wear glasses, you're not standing. Stand up. Okay. If you're a West Virginia native and you're not standing, stand up. Okay. If you ever had chicken pox, stand up. All right. Now, all these, all these categories that I asked for, they fit me. Look around. Practically everybody in the room standing. Y'all just like me. <laughs> Let's not magnify the differences 
but we must look for the similarities. Once upon a time. Thank you.